But now it's time to talk. Uh, it's time to uh, uh, to have our first keynote and presenter, Sanjit Paul Sudari. So Sanjit is the author of these two great books, Platform Revolution and Platform Scale, that I really recommend uh, about platforms. He's one of the most knowledgeable person on the topic. So I will ask uh, Sanjit to join the stage and uh, and share what he got for us because I think it's a uh, he prepared some good content. Hello, Sanjit. How are you? Hey, Mehdi. Doing very well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We're really glad to have you. Uh, right, that's. Uh, uh, we think it's uh, the topic is extremely important, and uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, platforms and APIs. And I let you the stage. I ask you to share your screen, and and let's go. Let's go for the best. Sounds very good, Mehdi. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, a real pleasure to be here today, and uh, I'm looking forward to the next uh, thirty to forty minutes when we talk through. Uh, some of the key issues around how APIs uh, are, are impacting the world around us. Um, now, to a large extent, what we uh, just saw in that comedy, the, the team kind of uh, covers a lot of the good and the bad and the ugly of APIs. I want to use some of those ideas, go a, a little um, more macro as well, and talk about how APIs, uh, you know, have a, 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 a great side to value creation and innovation. There's also a negative side where APIs drive more inequality and control and, and how that happens. I just want to run through that as well. Um, but eventually, APIs are not just about a new channel or a new way of communication. They are about fundamentally the organizing power structures. And I'll talk about what that means, but fundamentally, any technology that allows openness, that allows superior um, uh, flow of, of information, reorganizes power structures. And that's uh, one of the key ideas I want to talk about as well. So today, um, we're at a point where, at a conference like API Days, I don't need to get into what APIs are all about. We're at a point where companies that have built only APIs have also scaled to tens of billions of dollars of value, right? Uh, they're the obvious usual suspects, uh, Stripe. I'm, it's, it's highly unlikely that somebody over here would not have heard of them. Stripe completely came and built their whole business as a, as a central API provider that would uh, orchestrate multiple stakeholders and their uh, flows and communications in one single place. Prior to that, Twilio had done something like that. And now we're seeing that happening across different industries. Uh, think of smart car, uh, much less known than Stripe, but uh, with the recent integration with Tesla uh, made some of the uh, made, made some headlines. And essentially smart car essentially takes every component of uh, a vehicle and converts it into an API so that it can then be embedded into third party applications, third party contexts. And uh, that again is a company which Ultimately, everything it provides is an API. So today we're at a point where we have companies like Stripe, Smartcar, Twilio, Agora, um, which does everything around Zoom and video conferencing, what we're using as APIs. We've got all these companies that are fundamentally not just opening up APIs, they are APIs. They are nothing beyond APIs. They are entirely APIs. And uh, that position of being a central API provider for, the, for a whole industry, for choosing which functions in an industry you want to abstract and convert as an API, and then make it embeddable across a whole range of contexts. That, once it gains scale, is a hugely powerful position. And that is why today more than ever before is an important time to think about how APIs relate to power. What, what is it about APIs that, that creates this transformational power? So I want to talk through some of those ideas as we uh, spend time over the next few minutes. And um, the first thing I want to talk about is that APIs fundamentally change the business model. They change the way value is created in the economy. And this is something that I've written about extensively. All of my work talks about the shift towards platforms. Traditional business models used to work like pipelines where you create something, you push it out, you get to the end consumer and you scaled because of your ability to own the connections. Either you own them through contracts, you would uh, have connections across suppliers. So you would build out a supplier network, set up tight contracts, uh, or the second way to scale was you would go down and build channels up till the consumer. And so ownership of key distribution channels was another way to scale this model. 
And uh, the third way to scale it was that you would then try to own this end-to-end -end pipeline, what we would call vertical integration. You would work across every element of it so that you were not dependent on external parties for production or, or distribution. And essentially, all of the all that these companies uh, did in order to scale was they would set up these connections and concentrate these connections, whether internally or externally, inside the firm. And that is how these companies scale, whether through traditional uh, through traditional contracting, through integration into the channel, or through vertical integration back further up the value chain. What ended up happening because of uh, technology and is fundamentally because of uh, the fact that companies could now transform business functions, uh, capabilities, open them up as APIs, was that the, the design of business models started changing from this pipeline-based business model to more of a platform-based business model, where because of the power of APIs, you can now allow a third party to connect to your business, create value as part of it, they can write in, and then there are other third parties who can read from that. And through a combination of these read-write functions, you now fundamentally change the way value is created in the economy. So co-creators and producers, whether they, they're uh, uh, other uh, providers of data, whether they are uh, other um, you know, co-creators of uh, actual content and value, all of them come in, they connect in, they integrate in and provide their value to the platform, which could mean um, uh, a, a way for two different applications to work together. It could mean uh, a way for two different uh, systems to, to communicate each other. And through that, to, by, by aggregating these different providers of value in one single place, consumers start coming in and then they start engaging with the platform business as well. So essentially, APIs enabled the growth of the platform business at scale. And as we move towards an economy where technology allows more than more things to be opened out as APIs, we're seeing the rise of platform businesses in a much bigger way. In fact, uh, once you start moving the traditional infrastructure of any industry towards cloud-hosted models, you can then start opening up all kinds of industrial functions in that industry to, to APIs. So think of a whole range of different industries. Think of, for instance, logistics, where the traditional infrastructure of trade has been pen and paper and uh, you know basic communication like email, uh, some uh, document management systems like SDOCs, et cetera. And uh, as we move towards trade software moving to the cloud, as we move towards trade workflow, whether it's in the form of logistics, uh, SaaS businesses, all of these things as they move to the cloud, they digitize the functions of trade and then eventually allow them to communicate through API so that now we don't rely on the basic paper pen communication, which was broken and which could only scale to a certain extent. Now we can see or coordinate the end-to-end -end shipment from source to destination across a whole range of different actors using just APIs. And, and that's what APIs fundamentally do, which is really interesting. When you think of it beyond the unit of just your company, when you think of it as beyond just how can I expose something in my company to others to use, when you think of it at the level of how can the entire industry infrastructure be opened up because the industrial processes, the fundamental processes in the industry are moving to the cloud. And in the past, they could not talk to each other. They were in silos going forward, they can speak with each other, you suddenly realize the transformative power of APIs. And um, logistics is one very good example, as I mentioned, because it's so fragmented. Uh, there are multiple stakeholders that move a shipment from source to destination. And so the ability for them to interoperate is huge. But if you take any other industry as well, if you take healthcare, data is heavily siloed. Data across uh, wellness and care is extremely siloed. And so the ability to have API-based connectivity and use that to create a single view of the data and to create a single view of the user across the entire continuum of care is an incredible, incredibly powerful position. So think of what Apple is doing with its health record, where it's combining data from radiology labs, from um, uh, electronic health record systems like Epic and all scripts, and bringing all of that through APIs down into one single health record. That again shows how power will start shifting as we start moving towards more of an API-based economy. Traditional power used to rely on locking in data, 
future power will rely on connecting data, but then building new value on top of it so that you have the right to keep connecting the data and you uniquely and centrally own that right to keep connecting the data together. So to a large extent, we see the positive side of this very clearly. APIs are the new freedom. And that what, it's, what, it, what that essentially means is that if you think of Stripe, Stripe provides a payments capability so that you don't have to worry about payments. You can just integrate Stripe and it manages all the payments between uh, the various players in your ecosystem. So think of Shopify, consumers pay uh, on the online shop and then the payments have to go through Shopify back to the various merchants. Shopify can just use Stripe to manage all of those payments. And that's the, that's uh, as I mentioned, APIs are the new freedom. That's the new freedom in the sense that Shopify does not have to worry about the payments component of their business that already exists as a service and Stripe provides that. So you can, instead of reinventing the wheel, APIs enable you to be free to just innovate on top of what already exists. And that's something that we clearly understand uh, given that we work uh, in and uh, you know on and with APIs. But what we also need to understand is that APIs are not just the new freedom, they are also the new control. And this, this again comes back to power structures. APIs keep shifting power structures. Think of what Stripe does. Stripe acts as a common payments layer across multiple platforms and ecosystems, across, across uh, Shopify, across Lyft, across DoorDash. And in all these cases, because it has to remit the money back to the merchant, it takes over the merchant's financial identity. So Stripe is in that unique position that if you drive a car on Lyft, if you also deliver, uh, or if you run a restaurant on DoorDash, and if you also uh, run an online shop on Shopify, Stripe can uniquely know that you are one single person who works across all these three platforms. So Stripe in a way has become the identity or the financial identity manager of this entire platform economy. But in doing so, all of these companies become increasingly dependent on Stripe. And that is where APIs are not just the new freedom. With every freedom, there's a new form of control that comes in. And in this case, Stripe now controls the merchant relationship. Now, you would argue that uh, uh, it's, it's mutually beneficial. Stripe, Stripe has to keep growing and the, the other companies have to keep growing with it. But what we've seen over the last 10 years from platforms is that platforms often shift policies once they grow really large. And Stripe has kind of moved from just being an API provider to now being almost a platform provider because it now has the, the primacy of relationship with the merchant. Uh, and as we saw with the launch of Stripe Atlas, uh, there are opportunities to then take this merchant relationship that they have and use that to launch much bigger products and services uh, directly out in the market. Uh, Stripe Atlas allows merchants to, to, to set up uh, capabilities to run their business and then Stripe Relay, which used to be another thing that they provided earlier, would connect these merchants with platforms like Twitter and allow them to sell directly over there. So as you see, uh, even just with an example of Stripe, even though Stripe provides the freedom for Shopify and Lyft to innovate on top of it, it also increasingly gains control from all of these interactions and scales way beyond many of these other platforms uh, which are scaling on top of it. So what we need to realize is that APIs for, for all the um, uh, innovation advantage that they open out whenever we're considering a, an API strategy, who should we partner with, what are the terms of that, we should keep in mind things around how an API-based partnership could eventually lead to a shift or a difference in power structures as well. Another thing to think about is that APIs create opportunity. If you think of it, um, as I mentioned, APIs allow you to connect with, uh, allow different businesses, different workflows to connect with each other and to, um, uh, to, to allow these different businesses and workflows to interoperate. But APIs also increase inequality. And this is not uh, an ethical question because wh whenever we think about inequality, we think about ethics. I'm just thinking about power structures. How do companies become more powerful than other companies? APIs increase inequality because while every company can open up APIs, not every company can concentrate the value of API exchange. And what ends up happening is that a few companies win because they develop network effects. The more APIs that get connected to you, which are contributing value to you, the more 
consumers of or API consumers come on board and that attracts even more contributing APIs to come on board. So there's a network effect where the more API contributions come on onto your system, the more API consumption happens from your system. So you need to realize that network effects ensure that the API economy moves towards increasing inequality over time, increasing concentration of power with a few players over time. Another thing that uh, you can uh, you'd want to think about is when you take network effects a step further and think about how data network effects work on data platforms. Um, here, multiple data partners bring in their data, and then multiple consumers come in and use that data. And it's not just the fact that multiple data partners bring in their data. It's the fact that once you have all this data coming together in a central um, platform, and it's not about data residency or about uh, data ownership. All of that could continue with other parties. But once data from multiple sources informs uh, the uh, one central player, there is new value created by linking all of this data together. As I mentioned with the logistics example, the one player that could link the shipments movement from A to B would be in a stronger position than every single other player in that in that uh, ecosystem. And so uh, another form of concentration that happens is this kind of a data network effect uh, combined with the ability to link that data. And the final uh, concentration that happens is in the form of learning effects, where the more API calls are made, the more data is captured, uh, the more user data is captured, and some of these calls may be read write calls. So if you make a call, you have to give back some data in exchange. And the more intelligence all of this data coming back feeds into the system so that you learn as a business and you make your APIs even better and, and identify new use cases, expand even further than other competitors who do not have learning effects kicking in yet. So my point again is to show that there's uh, there's clearly uh, an, an, an extensive opportunity and freedom that comes in because of the API economy, but at the same time, there's concentration, there's a shift in power structure, and we should uh, clearly be aware of that as we uh, not just participate in the API economy as businesses and, and builders, but also as regulators. Another thing that's important to uh, understand about the API economy is that APIs fundamentally are about unbundling, which is that because two things can be connected, you can unbundle them from each other because you can just open up API and uh, allow them to talk to each other. They no longer need to be part of the same company. You can unbundle that completely. But APIs are also about rebundling. And uh, let's take an example of what unbundling and rebundling is about. So think of uh, the traditional newspaper. Um, a newspaper company used to work like a bundle in the sense that uh, a, a newspaper um, bundled the various news articles and bundled advertising with it. And the newspaper company did two things well. It could create really good content and it owned the channel for distribution. And these two things allowed newspaper companies to scale over time. Now, what the internet did, similar to what APIs are doing across industries, the internet first did to content something very similar. They, they brought down the, the, the cost of communication and distribution to near zero. And news could now be distributed without any cost associated with it. In the past, there was the cost of the paper. Now it could be distributed without cost. And because of that, news got unbundled. So you do, no longer needed to get all the news together. You could just read one article. And today, this seems obvious. But if you think of the economics of it, the fact that you could now just read a single article independent of the whole bundle started taking power of advertising away from the newspaper businesses because they now did not own the bundle. It had become unbundled. And so power shifted to the, the companies that were able to rebundle the news articles. And the two companies that did that were Facebook and Google. Facebook with the news feed, rebundled news articles. Now uh, we read news on things like Facebook, we did news on, on Google by searching on Google. And so Google with its search engine rebundled news articles. And because of that, advertising shifted to the rebundlers and moved away completely from the traditional news companies. What these companies also did was they over time built out data and content infrastructure. Google set up SEO standards. Google provides page optimizer. Google provides uh, you know, site optimizer, Google Analytics. All of this is infrastructure for web developers who now 
create content. And so the future infrastructure of news is fundamentally provided by Google. Similarly, Facebook provides a lot of infrastructure in the form of uh, Facebook Connect because you can go into a third party news site and log in with your Facebook ID. And that's a data infrastructure that Facebook is providing along with a data sharing relationship that they have with that news site. So because of these two things, because the, these companies now rebundle the relationship and rebundle the infrastructure at the bottom, they gain all the power. And in, to some extent, similar things are going to start happening in the financial services industry, if you think of it, because traditional banks combined financial products with the channels to sell them. So you had to have a banking relationship to get a loan, to get uh, insurance, etc. But with PSD2, Payment Services Directive um, uh, regulation in Europe, uh, or with other open banking regulations around the world, this is getting unbundled because now banks are required to share their data with third parties. Banks with you can, can now take their products and serve them as APIs into third party ecosystems. And so the traditional bank is getting unbundled in the same way because of APIs now. And so the same thing that happened in the news industry in, to some extent will start playing out over here because unbundling and rebundling is something that always happens once digital technologies come in. And so what we're going to start seeing is increasingly two things are going to happen. Financial products in themselves are going to get commoditized and because of APIs, they're going to get embedded into other third party ecosystems. And that's what we now call embedded finance. But you could be at a shopping site, you could be at a real estate portal and you could find a mortgage or a, a consumer loan right there embedded over there, customized for you. And that is happening because of that kind of API connectivity. Similarly, the infrastructure on which these financial products are served, all of that is changing as well with improvements in technology. So ultimately power shifts to these companies that sit at the top or at the bottom, taking it away from a lot of the incumbents um, in, in these kinds of uh, scenarios. So that again is, is something uh, where the power of APIs increasingly creates the value towards a few specific companies, which, which are, are, are some of today's largest tech companies for that matter. So the point over here again is that APIs will drive unbundling and rebundling across industries. We've seen that in a few industries, we'll start seeing it in healthcare, where today the healthcare delivery is bundled inside the hospital. Tomorrow it could be provided to your home because uh, the a device in your home through API connectivity is, reads uh, the EMR data from uh, the hospital and is able to provide you the right uh, service and exchange. And so we're, we're going to start rebundling a lot of these experiences and fundamentally we're going to start changing the way industries work essentially what apis do is they allow industries or functions from industry a to be embedded inside functions of industry b so think of uh, how we used to think about computer architecture the hardware architecture would be built on embedded systems and every system in itself would be a complete system embedded inside another large hole. And that's what APIs allow you to do. You can take any abstraction of an industrial function and embed it, it in another industry. An example of that again is think of loans. Loans are today embedded inside other players. They're embedded inside accounting software companies like Intuit. They're embedded inside payments companies like Square or they're embedded in marketplaces like Amazon. All these companies today provide loans because they have better data, they have proprietary data about how merchants in their ecosystem behave. They have the ability to identify who needs a loan before that person even needs a loan. And all of this again happens because of the fluidity that APIs bring in. A final couple of things I want to talk about is that APIs change not just the nature of the firm, they also change the nature of the industry, the structure of the industry. What we understand quite well today is APIs dissolve firm boundaries. They make the firm boundary less to, uh, uh, to put a word to it. So think of this, the traditional firm used to work like this. Uh, it would have three uh, key functions. There would be a customer relationship, which would be marketing, customer delivery, customer service, et cetera. Uh, there would be a product creation part of it. And then there would be the underlying infrastructure that enables that product creation. So traditionally, there were these three parts to a business. And what APIs do is they change the way the firm organizes around this. Traditionally, companies would vertically integrate, as I mentioned. They would vertically integrate across these three because they wanted to minimize transaction cost, the cost of coordinating across these various functions. If 
all of these things were being done by a company externally, the cost would be much higher. And so by owning all of this internally, they would minimize transaction costs. And we've seen that at every point when technology has, has reduced transaction costs, these things have started getting unbundled. And APIs are the final, uh, you know, or, or the most recent frontier over there because this, this would have started from outsourcing and outsourcing started unbundling some of it. But with APIs, we're really at a point where we're moving away from this vertically integrated model towards complete modularity. And Stripe, Smart Car are just great examples of you can just take payments, make it a modular business, create that as an API and make a whole company around it. And it can now be embedded into a whole range of different scenarios. And that's what makes APIs powerful because they don't just dissolve the firm boundaries, they restructure what an industry should be. So one way to re-architect things is once everything becomes modular, once payments can be got from somewhere and a checking account can be obtained from somewhere else and a customer relationship is with the third person, you could, one thing you could do is you could just restructure everything the same way. You could just say it's three different companies doing it. Everybody's more specialized now, but it's not all contained in the same company. And that, that would be one possibility, in which case we'd say that APIs are just making things more efficient. But what actually happens, what the real possibility is now that everything is an independent entity and can move as an independent API, you can rebundle them in a whole number of different ways. You can have a loan being positioned inside uh, uh, inside a, a real estate portal. Uh, you could be shopping for food on an online grocery uh, uh, chain, and and your uh, data about your diabetes situation could be used to show you the right things over there. And so, industrial boundaries completely start changing. Healthcare can move into food. Financial services can move into trade and health. And essentially players across industries can start now crossing industry boundaries and moving into new industries repeatedly. And that all of that happens because APIs allow fundamentally new ways to rebundle things. So in conclusion, uh, if I were to just close this in the next couple of minutes, I want to leave this specific idea that APIs do not merely just reduce cost, add efficiency. They're not just a new communication channel. That would be the most basic way of thinking about APIs. So if, if we were to think about APIs as just reducing costs, we would essentially be saying instead of vertical integration, now we're moving into open consumption where anybody can consume from us and anybody can interact with us. But APIs, they do not just add efficiency. They fundamentally re-architect your business and your industry, and, and they do that either because you can now completely benefit from innovation beyond your boundaries, or you can completely cross industry ecosystems for the first time. You can build entirely new cross industry ecosystems that combine things from multiple industries and yet work together to serve a user's needs cohesively, all because all of your partners have opened up APIs and have agreed to work together. And that I believe is the real opportunity that we have in the API economy, not just opening up, making things more efficient, allowing consumption, but the ability to start building these cross industry ecosystems, the ability to take what is best about a certain firm, convert that out as an API, focus on what you are good at, combine the two things and figure out how to solve customer problems best using this recombination. And that's the real power of APIs. They allow us to solve customer problems without being constrained by your firm's capabilities, your industry's capabilities, or any form of traditional boundaries around it. Thank you so much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions now. And uh, thank you once again. Yeah. Hello, hello, uh, uh, Sanji. Thank you for uh, the presentation. Uh, so we have some question in the chat, but it's funny. So I think Barbara was saying, yeah, uh, but are we? Do we still have some industry boundaries? And the next slide was breaking industry boundaries. So that was definitely um, uh, spot on. So uh, we have a question about um, you know business models because it seems from what you are sharing that uh, everybody can now embed anybody else value proposition, right? So now it's just a question about reaching customer and having customer attention because we can embed everybody. So horizontal integration for every, for everything, no? There, so and so let me interpret that question as where what's what's possible and where this uh, where is the new value, right? So clearly one of the key um, 
uh, and both my answers are going to be about horizontal integration. I think that is the big shift that we are moving towards because traditionally, as I mentioned, it was all vertical integration. Today, you want to do horizontal integration at two parts. If you understand customers, if you are customer centric and really understand the job to be done, you don't have to solve everything. You can just work with all of your partners, get their APIs, uh, connected and uh, use that to orchestrate a solution to the customer. So uh, the ability to aggregate customer attention is a, is is a key um, is a key position of power today. Whoever can aggregate the customer attention can get APIs from all partners who want to come and serve that customer. So that's going to be the new scarcity. The second thing that's going to be important is that as we move towards an API-based economy, we are increasingly going to see parts of our industry, parts of our ecosystem where APIs have not come into the same extent. And once we start seeing those things, the first movers who are going to come in and change the infrastructure over there, either as SaaS businesses or as standards creators or as consortia, Whoever comes in and tries to digitize that piece has the first mover advantage to now setting up the new infrastructure for that component. And that is why it's not just the, the, uh, the aggregators and the marketplaces and the end players, but also SaaS companies who are in really powerful positions to fundamentally rethink a workflow, digitize it for the first time, and then become the hub for connectivity that then uh, uh, allows uh, the whole industry to organize around it. And, and uh, uh, the, the third, uh, you know, horizontal position is, of course, companies like Stripe and SmartCard that fit in between and can organize everything on the supply and demand side across the industry. So it seems we have, uh, let's say, capability enablers, uh, aggregators, but also ecosystem orchestrator. Uh, yeah. there, and we have a question actually here, uh, maybe on the more economical level. Uh, when does it make sense to uh, build versus participate into an ecosystem? How would you yeah, that, That's a really important question because there are multiple factors to think about. Uh, one is that uh, you need to see uh, what is the control point or the control position of the ecosystem owner and what is your control position and, and can you coexist comfortably? So what that means is that um, um, if if if, if you're providing a really important API or capability into a third party ecosystem, let's say Stripe's payments into Shopify the ecosystem, you're perfectly fine working as part of other ecosystems as long as you know your control position, which is the, the merchant relationship and the ability to manage that whole financial transaction with him. If on the other hand, you're providing a commodity, then uh, say a bank providing a loan, if you participate in ecosystems, you eventually have to, but you'll also increasingly get commodified because when every bank opens up an API, it becomes a race to the bottom. So you have to think through your strategy across the board of what are the points at which I participate in ecosystems and what are the points at which I build or I create a strong position in, in certain ecosystems. And you will always have to do a combination of the two because it doesn't make sense to say we're not going to participate at all just because we get commoditized. But what's important here is you need to, to move in that direction with a clear, uh, you know, a, a clear point of view on which parts of your business you're comfortable to commoditize and which parts of your business you're going to start controlling. And so I'll take another example. Think of telcos. Telcos, like banks, are, are struggling today to, uh, to participate in the whole Internet of Things space. And they realize that a lot of the sensor network infrastructure they provide is getting commoditized, whereas the power in the ecosystem will be in the data layer. And so a lot of these telcos, you think of Verizon, AT&T, all of them have been buying or acquiring uh, data companies uh, across the board because that's where they want to shift. So it's a you need to think about this holistically. There might be scenarios where you do not have the resources internally to control the ecosystem or to be in the central position, and you might have to go ahead and acquire uh, th uh, that as well. Um, but those are the considerations you need to think through about when to build and when to participate. So we have two questions uh, uh, there from Leo and uh, Nadit. Uh, the first question from Leo is that, do you have an example uh, of, uh, um, uh, let's say, a successful implementation of such a business model in the marine logistics or supply chain? 
Yeah, I, I think it's um, it's it's still catching up, but um, I would say that uh, there are there are a few companies that have done uh, this fairly well, especially in the supply chain um, part of it. Uh, think of a company like TradeShift, uh, which is not fundamentally, uh, I would say, an API company like Stripe. Obviously, it's also not as open as some of the other supply chain companies. They they're more of a closed ecosystem in the sense that you have to be uh, a member of that ecosystem to be digitized within it, but a lot of their expansion now is being fueled by APIs, where they're allowing a lot of uh, banks and other uh, third parties who um, who enable that whole trade lifecycle to come together and integrate with them in one single place. So uh, that that's one one company that's using the power of APIs uh, really well right now. Uh, mining again is is uh, uh, you know at a point where this is taking off. Uh, I. I am currently advising one of the largest mining companies in the world, and uh, they are building uh, up the um, they're, they're building up a central data platform to bring together all the various capabilities around or all the various knowledge points around mining, which could range from knowledge about uh, the you know the quality of the rock, knowledge about prospecting, uh, knowledge about uh, uh, the uh, you know the the uh, the factors that should go into drilling, and then a whole different range of ecosystem players connect in to benefit from that. From researchers who want to understand ge geological researchers down all the way to other mining companies, and so uh, that's one example where it's it's kind of coming together in the mining industry as well. So two questions that relates with each other. Uh, there is there is a question about the risk to be dependent when you use a third party API, right? And then the other question is, is like, what is uh, uh, like how we are sure you we are using the right API? I'll let you the technical aspect out of the discussion, but yeah, sure. how how can we decide the right API to rely on? Safely? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the risk, you know, I, I talked about that uh, um, at length through the through the session because I wanted to bring out that it's it's not just all rosy APIs are good. That's great, but with everything that's good and provides freedom comes a new form of control that we do not see and a shift in power structure. Um, but um, uh, so that's one part of it. But the second part of it, which is, uh, you know, how do you know which API to build onto and which API to choose versus not? It's a combination of two different things at a minimum. One is uh, what is the uh, future development roadmap of the company that's publishing the API. What kind of developer support history does it have? Um, and you know, it could even be a company that does not have a history. In which case, you would see uh, who who who's running that show, who's running the de developer relations, uh, and what what kind of uh, an ethos does that person come with? So a lot of those things start getting. Uh, uh, you know, embedded into the the policies of the API, the company as well when they put out APIs. So that's one of the things that I would think of in due diligence. And the second thing would just be a due diligence of the API as a contract, uh, which is what what's required, what, what's the exchange look like, uh, what is the read write uh, transaction involved. So thinking about all of those uh, elements. So from a business perspective, I think about at least these two things. So last question is actually it's funny transition because the keynote after uh, after you uh, we, we had a discussion a few years ago and he told me maybe you talk about APIs models and everything at the end the the business model of opening at the end is closing right you know yeah. this control Obviously. this control aspect and then on the technical side you often said APIs are as much exposing as hiding right so always mm -hmm. this idea uh, so yeah so do you agree with the, the the business model of opening is at the end of, a part of closing or control? I, I, I do. I mean, uh, the thing is that uh, control has always been the, I mean, all business is about controlling an asset and renting it. The nature of the asset has changed. That's the only difference. We could talk about open ecosystems and open this and open that, but we, there's still something being controlled. Google controls Google Maps, and so it is able to manage the Android ecosystem. Uh, Facebook controls the data, so it's able to manage that whole media ecosystem. So. When you open something, and if you still want to make money, you have to have control shift somewhere else. It may not be within your business, in which case you may not make the money, but wherever money is being made down the value chain, they will, and if it's not funding and grants, if it's actual money, market economics, there has to be some form of a control that's coming in over there, which is why uh, you know I, I work with a, uh, with a lot of uh, banks in Europe, and when this PSD2 directive came out, everybody wanted to start building out APIs, and 
my point was that API building out APIs in response to regulation is not a strategy. In the long run, you're, you're going to commoditize yourself if you just keep saying, I'm going to open, open, open. You have to think about what is the new business model. The new control may look different. You may not be set up um, uh, you know, philosophically and infrastructurally in order to exploit it, but there has to be a new control and you need to think about what that's going to be. Yeah, thank you very much, Sanjit. I think it can be really insightful and introduce the next speaker. So uh, just to say, you your two books are great. Thank uh, you. I really recommend them to, to read to know more about platform, platform revolution and platform scale. And also you are publishing some, some new material, uh, right? So anything uh, uh, that, that's come up, uh, we can share it in our newsletter. So please, all the listeners and attendees, uh, check the thank you newsletter for getting uh, updated about what Sanjit is, uh, is publishing these days. Uh, where we can know more about your blog and platform, Pipeline to Platforms? Um, yeah, I, I, I think you can uh, you can check out uh, platformthinkinglabs.com, which is uh, my website, or you can. I also have a newsletter on Substack. Uh, very simple platforms, the plural platforms. Substack.com, and yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, we will send that to all attendees uh, in the thank you newsletter. Thank you, Sanjit. It was the, one of the best introduction we could have uh, on thank the topic. You. I invite you to unshare your screen, and so we can have our next uh, uh, speaker coming. Thank, Thank you. you.